Hi there. Welcome to New Tracks Modeling. New Tracks is an exciting new digital opportunity to obtain mentoring to help you improve your modeling. You will meet talented modelers and manufacturers from all over the world who share their model building skills and artistic advice. Improve your modeling and increase the confidence in your modeling efforts. Share your building efforts with fellow modelers and have some fun doing it. The shows are live on Zoom and YouTube, so be sure to join in and ask your questions. Now here is New Tracks founder and your host, Jim Kello, MMR. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really do appreciate it. Hope you'll come back often and hope you'll tell your friends about us. Uh, before we actually start the show, I want to introduce Father Ron Walters for the, uh, the show's prayer. Father Walters. Oh God, as we create in miniature the world around us, may we marvel at the beauty and genius which created the world and instilled in us a portion of your great knowledge and wisdom. Give success to the work of our hands, O God. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. We really appreciate everything that you do for our show. And now I want to introduce uh, a video for the uh, sponsor of tonight's show, Brennan's Model Railroading. For over 25 years, Brennan's Model Railroading has been offering unique products for the old scale market. Our flagship product, Brennan's Better Ballast, was an instant hit and continues to be the industry leader. Its prototypical size and natural color blend of real crushed granite make it the choice for discerning modelers. Since then, we've developed a complementary line of natural ground cover materials. Additionally, we offer craftsman kits that anyone can build with complete photographically illustrated instructions that assume you've never done this before. The Sonki Wanky Coffee Company is the latest and the fourth kit to be added to our ongoing and highly popular limited edition Ellison Tribute series. These kits take Ellison's scratch-built iconic structures to a new level with Dennis Spin. The idea being, that if Frank were alive today, this is how we would build these models using modern methods and materials. Use the QR code to visit our website. Thank you so much, Dennis. We appreciate uh, your sponsorship of our show. Well, now I want to introduce uh, two people that are going to be in charge of the My Bill from now on. Chris Force has been doing it for, by himself for a long time. But because we expanded it now to include a whole segment of one of our monthly shows, uh, he's asked Greg Cassidy to, uh, to join him in this endeavor. Uh, but before they come on and talk to you about the upcoming uh, My Build on the 24th of April, I want to run a video that I forgot to run the last My Build segment of the show, and that's of the sponsor. Uh, who publishes both of the magazines that I write for. So I've got to make sure that I have covered that. So Greg, if you could play the video, please, for Model Railroad Resource, LLC. Welcome to the world of scale, O and S railroading. We are your resource for all O and S scale modeling. Both our magazines are advertiser supported and free to read online, download as a PDF, or even print. All advertisers are hot linked to their website so if you see something you like, just click.
please check out our websites for the current issues. All back issues available free for the O Scale Resource and the S Scale Resource magazines. And, if you are a manufacturer, distributor, or retail establishment, please contact us through our website for advertising opportunities. Well, that's uh, that is a sponsor for the My Bill uh, segments of it. Uh, the reason that's such a, tip, a a great sponsorship is that both of those magazines have as the basis for them uh, bringing modeling back into uh, model railroading. Uh, and and there, it just seems like a natural fit to me. So with that said, I want to introduce Chris Kors and Greg Cassidy, who are handling the uh, the My Bill, the next one being on April 24th. So Chris, Greg, welcome. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. All right, uh, I guess. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Greg and I, uh, well, first of all, the slide's are wrong. It's the 24th and not the 17th as listed on here. Uh, Greg and I are going to get together this weekend and we're going to put together a little promo video for uh, for the My Builds. But uh, anyway, uh, for this month's My Build, the April Challenges Spring. Show us your uh, spring scenery, your flora, vegetation, trees, something wild, flower boxes, vines, backdrops, planting crops, um, basically the world coming, uh, waking up after winter, uh, those sorts of things. Um, like I said, that date of the 17th is not correct. It is the 24th. Uh, so please have those photos to me by the um, 21st, if you could. That way we can, uh, we can get them all put together into a nice slideshow uh, in advance. And uh, if you have not participated in the past, Please uh, send us uh, a photo of yourself for your um, for your introductory slide. And uh, if you are, for whatever reason, are not going to be there or the possibility that your internet could be down, please include a description. That way we can uh, talk somewhat intelligently about the slides that you've uh, sent over to us. And so there's that. Uh, Greg, did you have anything you wanted to add in there? I think you've covered everything, Chris. I'll see you this weekend. All right. Sounds good. All right. I'll turn it back over to you, Jim. Let me mention one thing. I got an email this week from a modeler. It said that uh, it wasn't that he didn't want to to show his models in the My Build, but he just he he looked at the quality. He wasn't sure his is up to the standard. As far as I know, we don't have a standard here. We're <laughs> we just want to see what everybody's doing. And uh Maybe we maybe uh, we can kind of try to get that message across, uh, Chris and Greg, uh, in the future to make sure that nobody nobody feels that they their models aren't up to some mystical standard. Because as far as I know, we don't have one. Yeah, um, yeah. There are no uh, there's no uh, standard that that we follow. So whatever you've got, um, even if it's just humble beginnings, we're, we're glad to see it. Yeah, I should uh, show some things in the middle of building them instead of when they're done, because you can see what a mess they are at that time. And I think that might be a good idea because, you know, for sure, we don't want people hanging back saying, well, you know, I'm kind of scared. I, I'm, I'm scared people laugh at my modeling and so forth. I know I felt that way when I first started showing people my models. And uh, yeah, we, we shouldn't want anybody to feel that way. That, yeah. That's my point. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, I have a lot of people that come to my booth saying, oh, those models look so great, I could never do that. I'm like, wait a minute, stop, hold the phone here. Yeah. What that actually is, all that weathering is covering up all of my sins. Yeah. So if you and look close enough, you'll find a lot of lot of, uh, lot of of sins in those models. And it's not like that's the first model you ever built either. No. <laughs> okay, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Well, let's start the show now. The first segment is uh, O-Scale Modeling, and our sponsor for this segment is uh, O-Scale Central.
I'm David Vaughn of Oscale Central. Oscale 2 Rail, models built to 1 to 48 scale and running on 2 rail track, is the best kept secret in model railroading. We're pleased to team with Jim Kello to introduce Oscale 2 Rail to new tracks viewers. Oscale 2 Rail is for modelers. At twice the scale and eight times the mass of HO, Oscale's half the knees of modeling create an outstanding model railroading experience. Oscale 2 rail modeling is as varied as railroading itself. Modern era, transition or old time, standard gauge or narrow. A wide variety of models is available at affordable prices. There is a supportive community and lots of shows, clubs and events. You can explore Oscale 2 rail by going to our website, oscalecentral.com. You will find information about the scale and how to get started, as well as a free, searchable, scale-wide product and service guide and listings of coming Oscale events. You will also find information about how to join Oscale Central. We promote Oscale 2 Rail and support modelers in the scale. When your eyes are going by focular, when you need fresh challenges, keep Oscale 2 Rail in mind. Check us out, oscalecentral.com. Thanks. Well, with that said, uh, now I want to turn this over to our host for the O-Scale uh, modeling segment, uh, Dave Schultz. Dave is uh, just one fantastic O-Scale modeler, and I really appreciate you doing this, David. Thank you. All right, I think that worked. Well, thanks, Jim. I'm kind of humbled by all this, but uh, anyway, we'll get our show started here with uh, this uh, segment. We're going to talk about 3D printing. Uh, I just came from the sh Chicago show yeah, a couple of weeks ago, and I went to a couple of the meetings. And uh, one of the one of the dire reports that were given at this at these meetings were a couple of brass importers who were basically saying that their their business was over. Um, they had imported uh, items from Korea, and the prices had gone so sky high that. Uh, the, the shipments they got were probably going to be the last of the import brass that they're, they're, they're thinking they're ever going to get because the Koreans are not willing to play cheaply anymore. They, they want more money, and, and uh, they felt the prices were getting up to the point where, you know, the passenger cars that the one importer was bringing in were going to be twelve to $1,500 a piece, and you just didn't feel that the market was there for that. And then another guy, you know, did uh, he does trucks, and his passenger car trucks are some of the best on the market. But uh, I guess many pieces and lots of labor. And uh, th this last batch that he got, I think he said they're going to be running in the $150 to $175 a pair. And he, he same deal, felt that the market's just not going to bear that any longer. So, you know, that, that was, it was kind of dire, you know. But... I'm, I'm look at it in a different light. I think what we're going to see is a grand change of the way things are done. You won't be going to Korea to have this stuff done anymore. And I think 3D printing is going to open the door to that. So the first time I ever heard about 3D printing was on the Big Bang Theory. I, I had no clue what they were talking about, but they were showing characters that they had printed of themselves. And I, I thought it was some kind of hoax or something. But then I was at... Uh, Best Buy, I think it was, down in the Mall of America, and they had a 3D printer there, and they were making a nut and a bolt. And when they were done, you could take the nut and screw it onto the, the machine screw. And I was absolutely astonished at this. But the thing was huge. You know, the, it, was, it was about a one-inch nut and bolt that they had, had made. But I thought, you know, the, the beginning of this is just rather incredible. So... And, and at the, the time, you know, you're thinking, well, okay, this is probably the Model T stage of 3D printing. It should only get better from here. And I, I think right now we're in the Model A stage of it. So let me get some pictures from the show set up here. And uh, we'll go through and I'll show you some of, the, some of the items that they were able to produce at this show. All right. Where are you been? All right. Yeah, you know, bear with me here, gentlemen, while I get this set up. Apparently, there's no way to do this beforehand. All right, I think we're ready to do this. All right, 
here was an item at the uh, O-Scale Meet. Uh, Dan Dottie, in fact, uh, printed these. Some little tiny wheelbarrows in O-Scale with the steel wheel. And I just thought these things are just incredible. They were so delicate. But it's amazing to me that a resin printer could print something this, this tiny and that delicate. And yet they, they held up pretty well. And only getting, uh, I think, about $3 a piece for them. So they're not even that expensive to do this stuff. And next, of course, the famous target signal. It was one that he had printed off. And you can put different colored LEDs in there. And it's as small as LEDs are coming these days. You could put all three colors in one target signal. And, and uh, But the cabinets on these, you can actually read, you know, union switch and signal and general railway signal on the cabinets themselves. They got the door latches. It's uh, rather impressive what they're able to do. And then, of course, the little fuel, you know, fuel tank, propane tanks, 150 gallon tank. And I think he was getting six dollars for that. That's kind of a neat little detail that uh, that they're starting to produce. This was all Dan Dottie's stuff that he was promoting. And then uh, snow plows. That was another one. And we'll come back to the snow plow idea here in a bit, because I'll, I'll tell you the next step that they're doing with this 3D printing. But stuff like this was always hard to get in O scale. Unless somebody was making them in brass, you could make them yourself, but that's real fiddly trying to get, you know, trying to get the curves correct and the door opening so a bit. Well, here's 3D printed snow plows. And I trust that the person who did these could uh, make up many different styles of plows to fit whatever locomotive you're going to do even that crazy Southern Pacific and that monster plow they had the front of their Fs. Here was All Nation, John, John Wobble's table. He had uh, 3D printed new floors and fuel tanks for the F units. These used to be metal parts, but now he's 3D printing these and he's using a filament printer to make these, but they, they, they tend to be very durable and uh, pop right into the shell. It's kind of, kind of unique. And this was same part uh, the fuel tank's a separate piece that screws onto the frame. Um, pretty pretty sweet deal there for, for upgrading. And then, of course, because it's plastic or nylon instead of metal, you know, shorts become a, a thing of the past. It's kind of nice compared to that. And then here's one outfitted with the trucks, the motor, the whole bit. And yet I was pushing on it to see, if, uh, see how sturdy that was and uh, amazingly resilient. Um, and once you bolt it inside the frame, of course, the flexing is not even not even an issue at that point. But uh, I thought this was very unique that that he could print these out like this, and they were fairly reasonable also. Uh, Scale City was involved in it with their stuff. This was a uh, a wheel template for painting. This was for thirty six inch wheels, and of course, the three D printer they could make them in many different sizes. Uh, I know, I know they've had these kind of things in HO scale forever. Uh, but you know, this one here can't remember the price. I wish I could, cause I, it, all of this was, was fairly reasonable to do this, but I bought myself one of these and, uh, in all the stuff that I bought, I still haven't found it. I got to keep digging. He is also doing little trailers and these little bullet nose trailers and the wheels and the dollies come as separate parts. So if you have older trailers, uh, the wood kits or the old Max Gray uh, brass trailers, you can replace the wheels and the dollies with these 3D printed parts and it'll upgrade your uh, upgrade your trailer. But uh, that he, I see the tag here off to the side. He's got uh, 3D printed dumpsters also. I didn't get a picture of that for whatever reason. But uh, anyway, those were he had some really nice stuff there at Scale City. And then we're back to John Wubble again. You know, the 3D printing, you know, people always said, OK, you're going to be able to make parts and stuff, but you'll never be able to produce cars. Well, you know, like I say, the Model A stage, we're up to this now. We can actually build cabooses and, you know, the sky's the limit. If you can if you can draw it on a computer, the 3D printer will print it. And this stuff is um, amazingly stiff. It doesn't uh, doesn't sag. I've got a caboose that's a couple years old now that I bought that. Uh, still as straight as the day I bought it. I, I feared a little bit that, you know, that uh, they might have a problem with sagging over the years. Uh, but I think these guys put a little bit of effort into it and they, they add stuff to stiffen the car bodies up so that sagging and, and warping isn't an issue. And uh, here was another caboose that he had there available. 
just showing the many different varieties that he can actually print with these. Another and another one. This one's got brass underframe and brass trucks. Uh, so you know it opens up a, a whole world of different. You know if you if you like the brass frames and trucks and stuff, you can easily add it to a three D printed caboose to add some weight to it. Um, just just kind of nice stuff, I thought. And then of course little engines. He's got this little mm -hmm. this little critter that I thought was pretty fantastic. It was all three D printed. He put. Uh, can't remember what drive he put in that, but that actually ran, which was kind of fun to see. And then, of course, he had the wind splitters, which I thought were pretty fantastic. You know, this this kind of stuff is is, is just just great. You know, his roof came in two parts because his his machine's not big enough to print uh, a complete car body. But I know that Dylan Lambert now is printing entire passenger cars, uh, 3D printing passenger cars. And uh, from the people that I've talked to, they uh, they thought they turned out great, and they seemed to be stiff enough to to span that ninety feet between you know the trucks. Uh, it's just just rather incredible. Another another car with the drive in it, and then uh, a friend of ours, Shaden Anthony. He's a young young man who is just fantastic at, at CAD drawings. This is his latest project. He wanted to build one of these SD fifties. Uh, I used to run these when I worked on the Canadian National. We didn't didn't like them so much. The control stand, uh, desktop control stand, so you're banging your knees on them all day. But they are rather a interesting looking unit. So he drew it up on his computer, and this was some of his first drawings. And then he started printing. And as you can see in this, the detail is incredible. That's why I say I think. You give 3D printing five more years, and I, I think it's just going to be astonishing what they're going to be able to pull off of this stuff. But here's the back end of his carbide. Now, he's he's designing it in many different pieces, but it'll easily almost snap together. I'm not sure if he's going to use mechanical fasteners or if he's going to use glue or, or what his plan is, but I know he's got a plan to get this done. But what what is fantastic is even the screens are see-through on some of this stuff. It's just incredible. And there's another view of that car body that he's building. This is a locomotive Dylan Lambert has built. And a lot of you guys remember him. He used to, he used to run the show here, but I think he got a little busy. But this is his latest 3D print. It's a Lima switcher. And he decided to go with that as one of his first ones because, I mean, who builds Lima switchers in O-Scale? They uh, merged with Baldwin somewhere in the early 50s. So this was about the only locomotive they really built independently of, of themselves. And I don't think a lot of railroads bought them. I, I'd heard rumors of the New York Central and the B&O maybe had some, but then they became Baldwin units. But uh, anyway, you know, they're, they're building locomotives. He's even 3D printing the trucks. He'll buy the Stanton drives to put in the trucks. And uh, he colored it on the computer to kind of show what, what it was going to look like when it was all said and done. He and I, mostly him, have been working on a uh, Baldwin locomotive, a DRS 44-1500, and the, its cousin, the 66-1500. Uh, he's 3D printing that one for me. I've, I've always wanted one. The Northern Pacific had one, one of the six-axle and two of the four-axle. Well, trying to find those in brass are just, just awful. I think Overland maybe made 15 of them. So whenever they do come up for sale, they're they're commanding huge prices for them. So I talked to him when I saw him building this Lima. I said, you know, would you do a Baldwin? And he said, well, if you can supply me with photographs, I'll do it. So I'm supposed to be getting, he's sent the drawings off to the printer. I'm, he's going to send the uh, first print to me. And uh, uh, when I get that, I'll have to show everybody close detail of, of what he's developed on this. But I think this is fantastic trucks the same way uh sarah grisenbach i know a few of you know her she is i don't know why this picture turned out as lousy as it did but she designed this switcher she uh, that's an atlas switcher and she designed the interior for this locomotive i sent her some photos she acquired photos from other people showing what the interior of the sw1 looked like and some of the early switchers and i wish i had better pictures of this because She's got the headlight controls on that. She's got the, uh, the, the brake stand has got all the, the unions and elbows. And it's just absolutely incredible. 
and the brake stand. She's got the wood floor there and uh, the seat on the other side for the fireman, the heater. You can see the little grate that went over the heater and the electrical cabinet in the middle. Just just something. And it slips right into, into uh, an Atlas switcher or even uh, Glenn Guerrero's new SW1 that he produced. I guess it'll it'll fit right in there. And here is another, you know, another view of that little switcher. But she's also, uh, uh, this was an outfit, I think they call themselves uh, 3D Central. And they're going to be printing her, her designs. She finally teamed up with somebody uh, to do this stuff. So she had, she had uh, I don't know if she did the forklift, but uh, I know the locomotive she had done. And she also 3D, 3D printed a tank car. This is entirely 3D printed. I, the trucks might be manufactured. But the tank car, the frame, all the underbody detail is all 3D printed. She uh, she is an absolute master at doing this stuff. It's uh, it's just amazing to me what they're able to pull off. So anyway, that is uh, that is uh, my program on 3D printing. Now the one picture I didn't have in there, uh, Jay Criswell, Criswell, uh, he'll take some of these 3D printed parts and he's doing a lot of experimenting with it. But he, he uses a wax-based resin and will print the part with this wax-based resin and then has a guy who will put the uh, 3D printed part into a porcelain mix, let it set up, and then pour brass in on top of it. And it burns away the resin part and breaks up the plaster and out comes a beautiful brass part. And so Jay is thinking that they're going to be able to do this stuff fairly reasonable where the price of trucks for even a locomotive will be down around a hundred dollars again for all brass pieces and uh there's there's some people who are saying they could even do that with locomotives if you can 3d print the locomotive they could 3d print it in wax and then put it in porcelain and pour the the brass in there to to make the locomotive so i think i think this is where o scale is going to be changing or and I'm not sure about, you know, the other scales as far as brass is concerned, brass imports, whether the price is going to hit them the same way it has O scale. But I think this is the future of it. I think, you know, 3D printing is going to be the way it's going to go. And that's not, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of the manufacturing happening back in the United States again. So anyway, that's my, uh, my program on 3D printing. I hope you enjoyed it. Next month, I think we'll tackle a little bit of scratch building. I've been busy in my shop putting pasture cars together and a few other odds and ends. So maybe we'll show some of that stuff on, on once again, modeling on a budget. Anyway, thank you much, everyone. And we'll uh, catch you next month. David, I can't thank you enough for sharing uh, your view of the O-Scale uh, situation right now. It was fascinating. And uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, the effort that you put into uh, doing the show tonight. Thank you so much. Well, now I want to turn to uh, our next segment, which is uh, O High Rail Modeling. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the sponsor for this segment is Will Millhouse Studios. Millhouse River Studio builds model train working accessories that are made to last generations. Millhouse River products are built out of aluminum and have scale brass details that even the most demanding scale modeler will appreciate. Since our industry entry in 2009 with the introduction of our flagship turntable, Millhouse River has continued to add new, innovative products, like our scale transfer table, rotary coal dumper, flood coaling tower and, most recently, a working conveyor that transports coal from the dumper to the loader. All of Millhouse River Studios' stunningly realistic products are currently available in O scale. We are adding new scales on some products including the upcoming release of an HO scale turntable featuring our aluminum construction and stunning brass details that is big enough to handle a big boy locomotive. When it comes to your layout, don't settle for less, get Millhouse River Studio. And 
our host for this segment is uh, Dennis Brennan. Dennis, welcome. You're muted, Dennis. Excuse me. Okay. I forgot. All right. Um, thanks, Jim. Hi, everybody. The last thing uh, I want to talk about the uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the last thing I do when I finish a kit or just before I finish a kit. And that is a little bit of chalk weathering. OK, um, and so with that, um, let me just um, share my screen here. And. Um, that ought to do it. No, that's, is that right? Okay. Um, I'm assuming everybody can see this all right. Yes, we can. Yes. All right. Okay. So here is my um, Richmond Packing Company. It's one of my uh, kits from the Ellison series. And it's a pretty simple structure. Um, and what I do, the last thing that I do, like I said, is some chalk weathering. And up in the corner here, you can see the chalks that I used. It's a dark gray, um, uh, a medium gray, a light gray. And then I used a simple artist brush. And then this, I love these things. This is a makeup applicator. Um uh, if you're married, ask your wife what that is and where to get it. You can get it in any drugstore or in any makeup department. And what I like about that is it's got a pointy tip on one end and it's got a, a you know, kind of a flat tip, flat uh, pad on the other. And these are great for, for using with chalk weathering. Um, and they're basically like a Q-tip with, with, um, nicer edges and they're a little bit more sturdier than a q-tip anyway that's what i used and so my whole approach to weathering is less is more okay now i'm not talking about um when i talk about this i'm not talking about old backwoods buildings or uh, a, a building that's supposed to be completely dilapidated but what I am talking about is um, buildings that uh, you will see on in any city or in any, you know, in any town. Um, and they're usually not falling apart. And that's a mistake that a lot of modelers make. They, <laughs> they think if a little is good, a lot is better, and they overdo it. And... Uh, like I said, less is more. So uh, if weathering ends up being the first thing that somebody notices on your building, I think it's overdone. It should just be there and it should just make the building look realistic. And, and, uh, and so you can see my approach here. And uh, what I did is I, I simply used... Um, the lighter chalks on the roof, I just streaked it down. Um, and where the concrete is over here, um, I used a darker chalk on the concrete. And then there's a little bit of a lighter area where the concrete leached out. Um, uh, maybe the cement leached or something over here. Um, and then under the windows is the next thing that I did. And I used, first I used a brush and I, to do this on the chalks, what I do is I scrape the chalk um, with a razor blade into a dish or onto a piece of paper. Um, I just take a flat edge razor and scrape it into the dish. And then I just dip the brush into it. And I put a little streak right here underneath the windowsill. Then I take my Q-tip or my makeup applicator rather and then I just kind of streak down and as you're going down if you it, you don't need to add any more um, chalk all you're doing is pulling down 
the dark chalk so that it fades naturally. Now, if it doesn't get quite enough, you can go back and do it, but put it underneath the sill and then pull down on it. And that gives you a nice weather, you know, faded weather um, uh, look. And that, that's just how it should be. Um, and then you can see that it's also gone all the way down and also hit some of this on the very bottom where the, where the base is. Now for the roof, this corrugated roof here, um, I sprayed that with two kinds of paint. Um, I did a, a uh, like a silver um, uh, paint. It was like a metallic silver, but I wasn't going after it for the shine shine. Because as you can see, this is not shiny. Um, you could even use a gray primer if you wanted to. Um, and I added some dark chalk along here. And then, um, uh, but before I did that, when I sprayed this, I used a dark gray primer and then I turned it so that the corrugations were, were uh, facing me uh, from the side. And I sprayed it in one direction with very lightly with a uh, Rust-Oleum, uh, probably a ruddy brown primer or something that was kind of a brownish rust color. And I, I, so you can see that's what the variation is. If you look at it, you can see that one side is a little bit um, more weathered than another with the streaking. And that's very simple to do. Again, less is more. Um, the stairway, uh, it, it represents a basically a wooden stairway. And I just took a mixture of India ink and alcohol. And that's like two tablespoons of black India ink with, um, with uh, in, in a pint of alcohol. It can be 70%. It can be 90%. It really doesn't matter. Um, some people feel that 90% is better. Um, because it evaporates faster. Um, I, I haven't found a big difference between either one of them. Um, and then as far as this, this loading dock is concerned, I used a um, uh, uh, stain. And it's just basically, um, I don't even remember exactly what stain I had used. It was a brown stain. Um, and uh, probably water based, um, and I just I just put it on and let it let it dry, wipe it off, uh, put it on and wipe it, and put it on and wipe it, and then let it dry until you get the effect that you want. And so um, that's pretty much it. Uh, as you can see, the building, in my opinion, looks like it's been there for a while. It's not overly done. And, and nothing in the building draws attention to itself. It just is. So um, that's just basically my take on how to approach weathering. And um, my approach to everything really is less is more. Um, so uh, think about that. Uh, and if you want to know how to weather something, don't just go by what somebody else did like me. I mean, it's, this is good, um, but you're better off uh, if you look at this and you like it, then go and look for some real examples. Take your cell phone, take some pictures, go into an industrial area, take pictures and use those for a reference. If you use somebody else's model for a reference, that's all well and good but you really need to look at it in real life to understand how it works and where it works. Also, one side of a building could be more weathered than another. Why is that? Because it <laughs> depends on which way the, you know, most of the weather comes. Like in, in my yard, the wind comes from one direction mainly whenever there's a storm. And so like in the winter time, my driveway could be blown off. Um, and the rest of the, the rest of the area is just completely uh, covered with snow. So that's something else to consider. 
Also, an industrial building or buildings in an industrial area are probably going to be dirtier and much more weathered than like your houses that are in a, a in the city. Um, and a house in the country might even be less weathered than houses in the city. Or a house near a railroad track might be a little bit more weathered on the track side. It all depends on where the building is, uh, which way it's facing. And again, um, the best teacher is observation. And that's what I do. Even though, um, uh, you know, I have, I have a good feel for this kind of thing. Uh, I use real pictures all the time. Whether I'm building a model, creating a kit, I go out and research the real thing. So with that said, I think I'll just uh, turn it back to Jim. And um, if there's any questions, um, just give me a shout. You know, I've said for a long time, Dennis, and I, can't, I really appreciate uh, what you've done tonight. But I've said for a long time, to me, modeling is modeling. It makes no difference to me whether it's high rail modeler or a two rail modeler or whatever it is. Uh, I think that the, the lessons that Dennis tried to teach tonight and the philosophy that he's trying to uh, talk about tonight works for both three railers, two railers, trolley people, you name it, uh, because it's all the same. It's all modeling. And Dennis, I really appreciate uh, the way that you're presenting this. Uh, so that people do understand that modeling is modeling, regardless who's doing it. Well, thank you, Jim. And I, yeah, at the modeling is modeling. I don't care what scale you're in. Um, uh, it, it just doesn't matter. So um, thanks for listening. And if anybody ever has any questions, um, please feel free to email me at Dennis at Brennan's model RR dot com you can find that on my website which is brennan's model rr.com thanks again guys and i'll see you uh next time dennis thanks so very much appreciate it well now i want to go to a lady sherry johnson uh who is one of the you know, owners of cat's paw uh, which is the oldest 3d printing organization in our hobby i don't know whether many people know that or not and Terry and her partner have come out with a new product called InvistaTrack. <clears throat> and she exhibited part of a diorama that she's building using her new product last week. And this week she'll finish it. So Sherry, welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. It is. <clears throat> okay. And as we mentioned, this is part two. Last week, uh, we were basically installing the system. And this week, we're going to hide it and do all the landscaping. And I'm so glad you guys started with this, this first one with the landscaping, saying that there are no standards, because I was really worried that you're going to critique my final product here. <laughs> I'm, I'm really not a modeler. I'm a maker of things. So uh, with that said, we're going to go ahead and start the process of getting the InvisiTrack hidden. And this is where we were last week. We had done the install and we successfully had the, the track installed, the chain installed, and our little revenuers were moving around without any problem. So the, the base is in. Now is the time to actually turn this into something that looks really, really cool instead of just seeing all the mechanical works. Even though watching the mechanical works is still kind of cool. The first thing I'm gonna do, since this is all gonna be hidden, is I'm gonna create, um, a pattern because I'm going to be building a mountain up around this and I just for me I I, I want to see where my track is and, and and use some things to cut out um, so I just grabbed a large sheet of paper and for this particular thing uh, 11 by 17 worked you could use other sheets of paper and I just used the side of a regular pencil and just rubbed it back and forth until I had the outline of where the track is then um, I took a sheet, the, the polycarbonate sheet that we used the first time that actually fits this piece, and I traced around the track onto the polycarbonate sheet. Now, 
previously or a lot of times my landscape is going to be flat and I would just attach the flat sheet to that. But this time I'm going to have mountains built up. I'm going to have a little pond in the center. So I'm going to have varying heights in my landscape. So what I want to do is use just the polycarbonate to cover the track itself. So I'm going to trace around it so that I know where to cut it later on. I'm using my paper template here. Uh, cut out a section because I'm going to put that mountain back in that the back part and in the right corner. And I'm just using uh, pink foam that you get from Home Depot. You get it from Lowe's. It's green. Home Depot. It's pink. It's it's the the foam insulation stuff that's like what an inch, two inches thick. Found this stuff a couple of years ago and I love it. Um, I also use some scraps of some foam core board. You can use whatever you've got laying around to to build up your landscaping. I mean, you guys are probably better at this than I am. Again, just using my template to cut, a, to cut out more pieces to, to fill in the center, to make sure that I'm building up around the track and where I want different grades, different heights, because I'm going to have some stuff in the back. Uh, what is that? That would be the back. Don't know my left or my right. Left-hand corner is going to be a little bit higher. we got some spots that are going to be lower. So I'm just cutting out the pieces and gluing it into place around the track, which we've already permanently mounted to the base. Next up, um, cutting in, I did find out, because I have one of those nice heat uh, foam cutters that, that has the nice metal rod on it to cut. I don't think it was meant to cut pink foam because it burned more of my foam than it cut my foam. It melted it and it made it drippy, but it got the job done. I probably should have just stuck to the box cutter, but I was trying to be a little quick. So I'm trimming out my mountain here, use the foam cutter, use the box cutter, which has made some scraps. Now, one of the things you definitely want to make sure you don't have is any scraps or debris in the in the track and where the gears are, because that will bind it up and, and stop the system from operating. Um, I used my shop vac and sucked everything out. Then I went back with a, the blow gun I have that I dry things and I blew stuff out just to make sure I got all the scraps out of there. Next, I want to test because I've got the, the the mountain in, I've got the landscaping in, but I need to make sure that I've cut it back enough so that my little revenuer guys aren't going to run into it. And I noticed that a couple of spots, um, he gets real close there, he scrapes the wall. He's doing pretty good there, close there, comes around the corner. Obviously, I've got something stuck in a track somewhere little glitch. I missed something even as careful as I was. But for the most part, my clearances are looking good. My figures are moving. They're not hitting anything. So I'm good to go to continue with my landscape. Now, later on, I'm going to use real dirt and the uh, turf powder to landscape. Now, all that stuff needs to stay out of my track. Don't want to get it in there after we're done. So in this case, I just used my string and I used that to line the edge of the Invisitrack track. And I'm doing that so that later on all that little fine particle and dust doesn't get in there. You could um, do many different techniques here. If this had been a routed channel, you could have just attached this over the top. But since I'm building up around this, um, I used the string. It was flexible, it was easy, and it was the height that I needed to fill in the space. So with my trusty hot glue gun and a few burns later on the fingers, I hot glued the string all the way around the, the track, making a nice seal so that nothing can come in from either side to get into my track system. Needless to say, after you get it all glued, you want to clean up all of those nasty hot glue strings that get everywhere. I don't care how careful you are, hot glue strings. So we've got to clean everything up, double check it. We're going to run the track again. And I'm running this at fast speed. Because if something's going to bind it, it's going to bind it when it's running fast. It'll hit it and, and lock up the chain and not make it move. Everything's moving fast, so it looks like I got everything out. None of my hot glue is in there. My, my trim around my track is looking pretty good. We're going to go back to the polycarbonate sheet that we had traced the track pattern onto. And basically, I'm going to cut around 
where I traced, I'm going to give myself probably, I think I did like a half inch, three quarter inch leeway around the outside of the track. I want enough overlap so that it goes over the edge of the track and over the string. Um, having been a seamstress in a previous life, I would call that my seam allowance. Um, I think it still works here. It's my seam allowance to make sure that everything is covered. And I'm basically going to cut it and trim it back until it fits into all my little curves in my landscaping and make sure that it's covering the track. And I'm just going to slide it into place there. And you can see that the, the polycarbonate is just over the track itself because I'm going to be doing multi-layer level landscaping around it, which is my first time doing that actually. So um, I'm going to temporarily attach this and I'm going to use my double-sided tape and I'm just going to put the double-sided tape into places uh, that have large overhangs, like where I've got some of my tabs where we can where we mounted the system. And I'm going to test to make sure that, again, everything runs smooth. That when you've got the polycarbonate on top, it's not binding. I don't have it too tight um, or that my string is too tall or too short. Knowing that the system is working good, I'm now going to go around once again with my hot glue gun. I got a, quite a workout with this project. And I'm simply going to mount the polycarbonate sheet to the string by running hot glue underneath that overlap and up against the string. And I'm filling this in. You can see up here in this right-hand corner picture, I'm filling it in with a lot of hot glue. Again, I don't want those loose materials that I'm going to use later on to get into my track system. If I could hermetically seal this, I would have, but hot glue was as close as I could get. And you can kind of see it's all the way around. And what do we do next? We're going to test again. I'm a firm believer in testing because you don't want to get it all together and then find out somewhere you bound it up and then have to rip it all apart. So we're going to test again with it permanently glued down. We could run our guys just a little slower. And we can see that it's running smooth. No problems. Now, when you come around this corner, I did have an issue here with that turn. And you can kind of see my little guys kind of wobble there. We're going to, uh, to fix that wobble without having to rip it all apart um, in just a moment. But they're looking good in every other place. They're running smooth. They're not hitting my landscape. So what I did, and if you recall from the, the first part, is our track has all, each little section has all these little mounting holes in it. I used the same 1.6 uh, M wood screws, little brass wood screws, and this time I just punctured through my polycarbonate and then screwed that through the hole in my track and into the base. So that way, if I had any of the plastic that was kind of bouncing up or, or not sitting the way I wanted it to, especially since I mounted it to the string and not something hard, I can anchor it. So I used my little screws there to anchor it into place. Another um, area that can be present a problem and I like to stop problems before they happen. And, and hopefully when we designed this system, uh, we did that. But one of the things we found is on occasion, the, the drive bearings, because if the chain is pulling on, it can cause that gear to, to ride up and raise up your landscaping. So what we've done is in the center of the shaft where we mount that bearing gear, we have a one millimeter hole. And you can see here on the left that I've got Actually, I just used a straight pin because it's what I had handy at the time. You could use a little tack nail or anything else that would fit the hole. And I just used, um, I think I used super glue on this, and I just pushed it in and glued it to the polycarbonate. That way, it's stuck into the wood below. It's holding the polycarbonate in place, and I don't have to worry about this uh, pushing up against my landscaping and vibrating in that corner. Okay. So now I'm more to the landscaping and less of the Invisitracks. And, and forgive me, I, I probably have used plaster or some other compound, but I didn't have any. It was late at night. I did have some spackling compound. So that's what I used to fill all the cracks in my mountain and, and my side. I just used plain old lightweight spackling compound. Works great. It's lighter than plastic. Um, it doesn't have all the moisture content that, that um, some of the plasters do, so it kept my foam core board from, from warping. And I just kind of filled in all the cracks and spaces where I had areas where my hot glue was a little wonky, where it wasn't smooth. I just 
smooth some of the spackling in there and and kind of smooth that out. Where my pond is, I smoothed around the edges of my pond so my bank would be at an angle instead of just a sharp drop off. So you can kind of see where my secret path is to get from, from down below up to where Moonshine Mike and Estilla is going to be on the hilltop. I kind of smoothed out the path there so it would make walking up a little bit easier. And of course, with all that done, I'm going to test again to make sure I didn't screw anything up. And again, I'm running at fast speed. You can see that it's running pretty good. And I actually um, am running the base on this without my people attached. My people were over being painted, which is why. I have the base here. I'm running it. Had there been any debris on the actual polycarbonate, it would have flipped that little, little base up and it would have flown right off of there. So running it at fast speed and it's sticking lets me know that I don't have anything stuck to my, my surface at the moment. So more landscaping. Um, I wanted to hide the pink. Didn't want the pink to show through. So I used some just plain old blast, uh, basic black matte um, primer that I had on hand. And I just sprayed my pink mountainside black. I colored in the pond where it's going to be with blue. Um, so that when I put my, my clear resin in there to like make water, it'll have the blue on the bottom. And where I'm going to have potentially dirt like around the base of my hillside and the edges. I just painted that all in with some some tan acrylic paint, the cheap stuff you get at 50 cents for the two ounce bottle at Walmart. Probably the most expensive thing outside the Invisitrax that I used was the stone paint. I think that paid like seven bucks for this at Ace Hardware, but it's really cool. Now, this time I went ahead and I masked off the polycarbonate because this actually has stuff in it. I don't know if it's sand or grit, but it's got lumpy stuff. It really does give a texture, a stone texture. So I did several, I don't know how many, maybe four or five thin coats of this on my hillside to make it look like it was a stone or a rock, uh, you know, hill. And you can see with doing the spray painting, it was a good thing that I masked it off. And in hindsight, I probably should have masked off my pond too, but I figured I'd leave that in there and it might make my pond look more realistic when I put the water stuff in. Peel back the tape and we can see that it's looking good. All the basic colors are there. We're gonna test again, just in case. And I'm running my little guys at high speed because it takes over a minute to do the full lap at a walking pace. So running at high speed, looking good. It's not flipping, it's not hitting, it's not bouncing. And if it runs at fast speed, it will run at slow speed. Doing a little landscape design here, adding more stuff, uh, just kind of placing things around to get a feel. I had these little rock things that I found. I've got um, a temporary placement holder, this little green car for where the revenuers are going to park their car before they get out. Kind of linking out how I'm going to put the, the moonshine still up there on top of the hill, how moonshine Mike's going to hang out. Actually didn't keep that design, but just some of the designs I was looking at, just throwing things out there to see where I wanted to put stuff. Next up, um, we're going to cover the track and it's not going to be hidden forever. I used uh, a plain grass mat that I got from Hobby Lobby, and the, the grass actually uses a nice soft texture to it. When I bought the turf one, it was actually sand, like sandpaper, which needless to say, you don't want to try running something smooth on sandpaper, but the green is nice and soft, and our people using the polycarbonate base actually run really, really well on this. How long it takes to wear a path in it, don't know yet. So I'm going to use some spray adhesive and I'm just going to glue this down on top of the polycarbonate and on top of the other flat landscape. I'm going to have to cut out my pond. I used Elmer spray adhesive, never doing that again. It is very liquidy and you can see in the, the big photo, the little dark patches, it actually, the moisture bled through the, uh, the, the, the mat. I was, I was shocked. Normally I would use Gorilla, their spray adhesive. It's great, it's tacky, doesn't bleed through, but I was out, used what I had. It works, but I don't recommend it. 
you guys probably know better about these things than I do. So you would have said, yeah, don't use that. So we get that on there. I cut out the pond. And now you're wondering, okay, everything is covered. How are we gonna know where to put our revenuers? We can't see the magnets anymore. Well, we have a solution for that. We have our magnetic field viewer. And this is kind of cool. I don't remember if you remember back in school, but used to have the little iron filings and the magnet would stick to them. Well, this is iron filings in like a little green gel. So when the magnet comes underneath, the magnet image pops up, becomes those little dark spots. So what I like to do is there's a spot on my layout where I know the track is going to come, which we know it comes close to the edge in this uh, front left-hand corner. It's going to place my magnetic field viewer over that, run my track on slow until my magnet show up. It's so my magnet show up. I'm going to stop it. And then I can put my revenuers on it. And once my revenuers are on it, we test again with the green. And this time we're going to let it run at kind of like walking speed. And you can see that they're actually moving really smooth over this, this green mat, which, which I was shocked. This is one of my new tests. And we can see they're moving, moving pretty good here. You can see I kind of decided, ooh, look, I've got beavers. I might put some beavers on the layout. And I could keep, I could let this go, but it's going to take, like I said, it takes a whole minute to do the lap. I'm going to wait and do the whole lap when the when the landscape is is done. Adding more details. Now for the uh, the still, I wanted to have uh, a fire effect underneath, and we do the the flickering campfire. So I just use the same LEDs, the little Pico LEDs, the flickering LEDs that we use in our campfires, and I just mounted them or drilled a hole so I can mount them underneath where my furnace is going to sit. So I just drilled a hole down to my mountain, ran my LEDs through there, and since we've got that whole base that's that's hollow, I just mounted my. Uh, battery holder under there, and I mounted the switch over by the switch that controls the Invisitrack system. Throwing in some, some cattails, some other green stuff. Just actually with the landscaping, I was winging it. Little close up up at the top of the way I actually finally finished off getting Moonshine Mike up there. So we got his still, we got the fire going, he's leaning up against a tree. We got some jugs, we got some crated mason jars. Um, he's taking a nap because he knows revenuers aren't going to find him. We got the revenuers down below. We've got the beavers over there and the cattails hanging out in the pond. Don't have the water in the pond yet, but we're working on it. Okay, we're now going to test. And we're going to test going clockwise first. And I always recommend testing fast speed, low speed, and going in both directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. That way you know that nothing's interfering with the system and you're not going to be hitting anything. And he just got tweaked by a couple of cattails there that I needed to move. But looking good. We can go the other direction. We can see them cruising around down here. Oh yeah, we added the snake. That was Yolanda's idea. She said we had to have a black snake coming out of the water. We're, we're still debating if it's a friendly black snake or if it's a cotton mouth water moccasin, but I'm going for friendly black snake because I, I don't like non-friendly snakes. Okay, we've got smooth motion going both directions, so that is making me very happy at this point. And we just continue with the landscaping, I'm adding water to the pond, which I still have a few more layers to go. I'm only about 95% done with, with this. I just didn't get it done in time for the show. Um, with the revenuers, uh, since they're mounted to the a piece of clear polycarbonate, it really doesn't show on the green grass, except when light hits it, and it had the reflection on it. And I decided I didn't want a shiny base. So I just used some Elmer's glue, brushed it on to the clear polycarbonate, and used some of that powdered green turf um, that I had, and just stuck that to it so that the base uh, matched the green that I was using. If you had a dirt bottom, you could put dirt on there. If they were running on concrete, you could do the concrete to match whatever it is that your, your figures or animals or whatever you're moving is going to be on. Okay. 
And we are up to test number nine, which is going around the outside here, because I want to make sure that I didn't get any glue on the bottom of my polycarbonate and that I didn't accidentally glue any turf on the bottom of the polycarbonate or on the edges, because you want to make sure that that stays smooth. So you do have to have that smooth surface sliding along. And if for some reason um, it's not smooth and you can't get it smooth, one of uh, a great thing that I found that you can put on the bottom is Kapton tape, something I use on the 3D printers. It's super smooth. I've also put it on the bottom of my uh, my mouse when my mouse feet wore out. Brings it back, makes it nice, smooth, and slick and slidey. Okay, some close-ups of how I had the final done. I added the, uh, you know, Moonshine Mike, he's got to have a rifle up there just in case the revenuers find him. We've got the snake coming out of the water. We've got the beavers and the cattails. Like I said, I still have to do some hiding and some water and stuff, but we're there. And we've got the car in place now. It's like we, we are done, except for the landscaping, and we give it its final test run. You can see them going around. And I actually filmed this outside yesterday in the wind, so it's pretty cool because it, the wind actually has my trees moving, which which was an unexpected benefit in, in filming this. And we can see that they're moving around. Moonshine Mike is napping. He's he's not concerned. They can't see him up there. No, oh, you can actually hear the birds chirping too. That's kind of cool too. Okay. Um, and that's that's kind of it. Um, Everything in this layout, uh, the Invisitrax transport system, we use the expanded set, so all the parts are in the expanded set. We use our revenuers, um, the build of still that we do, the mason jars, moonshine jugs and crates, beaver snakes. These are all things that um, are available for purchase in our store. Additional materials that we used, uh, just landscaping stuff that I had around. I actually used dirt from the field in spots, some tree pieces, um, the mat that I was talking about, the stones, the paint, the glue. Like I said, all the stuff that you guys who do landscaping on a regular basis probably know about. And I'm open for questions. Jerry, I can't thank you, you for doing this. Go ahead. Somebody's got a question. Yes. Yeah. You're moving people. Can you move a car? Yes. Um, you can move cars. We've moved cars. We've moved tractors. Um, we've moved G-scale animals. We've got a really uh, cute thing with a G-scale armadillo going through um, the, the woods. I don't have that here. Um, pretty much anything you want to move, you can. As aside from a train. We wouldn't want to try putting a train that's made to run on tracks on this, but pretty much anything else, people, animals, motorcycles, bicycles, cars, tractors, um, farm implements, uh, you name it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Folks, Sherry has a, a brand new video out. Uh, I was going to play it tonight, but because she's over her time by about 12 minutes, uh -oh, sorry. Uh, I can't I have time to do that tonight. Uh, but she can. I, I, hopefully, before she gets off the show, she can put into the chat function how to reach her video on her website. And I really rec highly recommend her. You take a look at her video because it's it's really something. Uh, and particularly to uh, to see uh, how far her company has come with three D printing when it started about sixteen years ago. If you can believe that, I've never even heard of three D printing sixteen years ago. I don't think. Uh, and her company was out there uh, already doing it. So Sherry, thank you so very much for doing this. You're Sherry, by the way, is a professional engineer, if you don't know this. Uh, and uh, she has uh, graciously consented to do some of our technology uh, segments on our show later this summer. And I think that's really gonna be fascinating because what you're gonna hear is somebody who has actually used the technology to talk about how we as model railroaders can start thinking about using the technology in our own modeling. And I think and, because and me, of her experience, I think it'll be uh, very interesting for you. I'd like to just add that um, the entire Invisitrack system is all 3D printed. 
And had we had to do this or wanted to do this 10, 12, 13 years ago, where things would have had to have been done with, you know, traditional injection molding and, and that sort of thing, this would have never seen the light of day. But since we have the technology and the 3D printers, we were able to test it, run it, and the final product is actually done on 3D printing. Fantastic. Thanks so much again, and we'll see you uh, sometime soon. And don't forget to put how to get to your website uh, to see that video, because I'm telling you, it's a great video she's put together. Well, for next show, uh, I want to introduce Tom Farrell. You all know Tom. He's been here. He is just one fantastic modeler, and uh, he is doing something tonight that I think you're really going to enjoy. So, Tom, welcome. Thank you again for having me. Um, I really appreciate the time and uh, showing what I'm doing on my layout here. So this evening is part four of the Turtle Creek series, which I uh, I think it's going to wind up being about eight parts when I'm all done. Um, the neat thing about doing the show is it pushes me to get work done on the layout. Mutually beneficial. So this evening, uh, I'm going to start with this uh, coal tipple. This is where I left it last week. And uh, you know, I wanted to put a sign on the coal tipple. And I was going to use one of my uh, friend's names. And then I got to doing a little research on coal mines. And um, I came up with this, uh, with this name, which is an Indian name. At uh, but it's great. I've lost you, Tom. Tom, you froze up. Uh-oh. Let's do this. Let's go to uh, Martin Breckbilt, MMR, for his scratch building corner. And Pat, if you can work with uh, Tom, maybe Tom can log back in and then we'll catch back up with him. Okay. So Martin, welcome. Yeah, let's see here for a second. <sighs> okay, Martin, here you go. Way, there we go. Martin, by the way, folks, has finished the April uh, observation newsletter that. Uh, on our website right now if you haven't gotten a copy of it yet and it's uh it's a great job thank you so much for doing that martin okay whoops that's one slide too fast wasn't quite 100 percent ready okay look then again i'm not sure i'm ever 100 percent ready <laughs> get about 90 i'm doing pretty good anywho okay yeah so tonight, a quick resurrection. So this refers to those pieces of junk you find underneath the table at a train show for five to 10 bucks that you quickly don't look at and keep moving and don't handle and walk away from figuring what a piece of junk. But Foolishly, I uh, actually tend to buy them. And sometimes I buy a whole box of them and, or two or three boxes of them. And I'm working my way through a few of them right now. So here's uh, one of the top ones. Uh, we'll go through the entire resurrection in one evening uh, instead of three days. So we'll uh, do another one next week probably though. Anywho, so it doesn't look too terrible. Uh, it's a uh, flat resin kit car, probably an old chooch model, which in their day were uh, pretty nice cars. If you could get a hold of one that was with good castings that weren't uh, cupped, warped, twisted, twice as thick at one end as the other, etc. They were uh, a recipe for madness to try to assemble at times, but once you jump over all the uh, obstacles, you could get a pretty nice looking car at the end of the uh, tribulations. 
This one, someone has done a lot of modifications to those doors. That's not the original door. And then there's a bunch of styrene bits and there's a styrene roof. I don't remember these having styrene roofs like that. And uh, some roof walk parts that aren't native to this kit and some other odds and ends. So there's been some modifications done to it. Somebody had some intentions of doing something and never finished it. Now we've got metal ends. Um, I don't remember these kits having metal ends. And in fact, I talked with uh, Bill Davis, and he posited that this might, were probably Ber the old Berkshire Valley cast ends, which aren't available anymore. So someone's married some ends, doors, and some resin parts, some styrene together. Uh, and you can see it's not quite right, because when you flip it over, not only is it naked underneath there, someone's taken a sanding block to it, probably was a fish belly car, and now it's not. Okay, well, I can't fix that. Can't put that back uh, without a lot of pain. Uh, but there are gaps behind the doors, be, behind the end castings that were added. So we got to go fill stuff and uh, make this something into something presentable. Um, yeah, we got to drill out the bolsters and uh, tap those. That's something you want to do. You get this. You want to do this as early as possible because uh, doing it later only makes it more painful. So you get out your uh, whatever number of drill it is and uh, taps and uh, get those holes set now. Doing it later won't be any easier. So, okay, so it's not so naked now. We got the gaps filled underneath the doors. We got some AV brake components in, lots of wire hooking it all together, brake levers, and all the plumbing and uh, rigging holding everything together. The uh, brake hangers have not been added as yet. Trust me, I'm going to put them in later. The two black uh, components are old all nation parts that I had laying around. The uh, triple valve that came with that set. I don't know what these are made out of, what kind of plastic they are, but it is very difficult to drill and control that drilling, even with a drill press. Uh, and I promptly ruined that the the, uh, the black triple valve, but I had a spare uh, white metal one, probably an old Walther's part, and that was much more uh, amenable to having four holes drilled in it. Yeah, uh, ran this train line through this. That was a lot of fun drilling holes through the uh, bolsters and uh, the center uh, supports there. That's uh, a little tricky getting a drill bit in at right angles down inside of a already assembled car so uh but it can be done in, particularly in this case it, it's accessible other cars like the one i'm currently working on i have no idea how i'm going to do that so we'll add the brake hangers later but you know this is pretty much done uh the ends well here's the boring end as i term it the, the non-brake end well, we've had an added attack board that's an old berkshire valley or a scale city that's a scale city part. Some uh, wire grab irons. Uh, I'm not sure whose ladder that was. It's one I had a pair of that seemed to fit. Uh, airline air hose added to the airline off the uh, train line off the, running through a, a piece of uh, brass angle. It's just uh, drilled, glued, and uh, threaded through and everything connected up into one unit. The more uh, complicated end, well, all the same stuff as the other end, but we've got a uh, brake wheel housing, gear housing, a brake wheel, a little bit of uh, wire hooked to a piece of chain, down to another piece of wire, down to the brake fulcrum. This is a plastic, this is, a, no, sorry, styrene. This is the styrene part from uh, Precision Scale. I didn't have, I couldn't find a brass one. Of course, I did find the brass one tonight. Uh, it's a little late now. So that's going to go on the th fourth car in this series. Or the fifth one. I don't know which. Uh, so keep moving. Okay, so we've got stirrup steps, some grab irons. Uh, the stirrup steps, I'm not sure what their origins are. Old, I think, is the... Uh, like me, old, 
Uh, I put these on with uh, a little bit of goo and some CA, and then I drill them out and actually pin them in place because otherwise they're going to snap off in the future. You, you'll break them off. And after the third time of breaking them off, colorful language uh, ensues, and then you drill holes and pin them in place because that's what you knew. That's what you should have done the first time. So I just skip right to the other end. You can see the brake hangers are in here now. And there's a brake hanger here for the other end. Okay. Uh, this was actually, we fortunately had a uh, decent day where the weather was up to almost 70 in February. And uh, when that happens, I quick run outside, set up a plank on top of the trash can over the blacktop and spray paint because I don't know when I'm going to get another chance this time of the year. And quick, just paint it and then pray the next day you can go out and hit it with some gloss. And Mother Nature was very agreeable and helpful. And uh, we were able to get some paint on, gloss, and some decals. Decals are from uh, K4. These are kind of fun to use. They're nice, uh, de nice decals. They're well-behaved. I don't have too much difficulty with them. Uh, they generally uh, are amenable to uh, persuasion when you need them to flatten down over uh, everything. And here we're done. This is the end of the end of the line. Uh, one car done. I seal everything with clear mat. I don't use doll coat. Uh, can't find it half the time, but I can find clear mat, so that's what I like. It's, it gives something in between. And uh, I like the finish on it. Add some uh, Bettendorf trucks. I think this is an old metal pair of uh, Atherin trucks, metal wheels. Some KD couplers on the end. And uh, this car is ready to go wherever it is going to go, which I don't know where that is as yet. It's in a box on the floor behind me somewhere. In a stack of other boxes on the floor behind me. And... That's where we are, are tonight. So it's not entirely scratch building, but you have to be kind of half scratch building to get to the end point. And you can pick up a uh, car that otherwise might be uh, described as a lost cause and uh, resurrect it for something decent enough to three, that easily falls within the three foot rule of viewing on the layout. And it just takes a little probably bit. Probably closer. Uh, probably. Probably closer than that, Martin. That's a beautiful job. Really is. I got lucky with that one. I like those. I really do like the resin cars. I have five or six others sitting on a shelf that were assembled but never finished. I'm, a, I'm sort of a sucker yeah. for out, outside braced cars. So I don't know what I'm going to do with them all once I get them done. But but they're not even in this chain of uh, or this queue of uh, models to work on. The rest are all. I think the rest. Well, the next one is. Uh, well, the next one is truly peculiar. I think it was a Walther's car that then somebody covered the entire car over with styrene. Huh. Yeah. Well, <sighs> you'll see it next but, week. It's a beautiful job. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, any questions of any kind? Or, or even ones just pertaining to this car? What's the brand of matte spray you use? That is uh, Rust-Oleum. Home Depot. Okay. Uh, I will warn you, <clears throat> it has the most, of all the paints I've ever used, it has the most noxious aroma there is. It's unlike all the other 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 uh, Rust-Oleum paints. This one, if I take the cap off, I can hear my wife scream upstairs immediately. I haven't even started the spray. So I don't even try to use this one in the house. This is definitely <laughs> one that goes outside, into the driveway, about 20 feet away from the house. <laughs> Downwind. Uh, Martin, yeah. the air hoses on the ends with yeah. the rubber, is that a unit that you can buy together? Um, you have to put those together. Those I, those were leftovers from um, Wiseman. They, were okay. a set that they came out of a Wiseman AB set that I did not use on the other car, on the car that I put the AB set under, and I still had them. So 
whenever there's a good excuse to use up some stray parts, I'm, I'm, I'm right on it. I, I liked them. I picked up a couple of cars at a flea market a couple of weeks ago and they have them on and I, I really like them. So I'd like to source them out and change everything over to them. Uh, Wiseman sells those. There's somebody else who has a similar product. I don't remember who it is. Might have been Scale City, but I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm almost 100% sure these were the Wiseman ones. The only, uh, there is a, uh, a requirement of considerable patience in getting the rubber tube onto the white metal tips, <laughs> of particularly when it's the hand. Uh, you know, you, you, the, the, the arm, you, you're, you're taking risk of bending it and snapping it with the hand. You're, you take risks of uh, just dropping it and losing it, but trying to force it onto that uh, little black hose. It's kind of stiff. Martin? I, th I think I'm still looking for three or four of them. They're in the vacuum cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get the cooperation of your grandchildren when your mom yeah. have them standing by. They got they got good eyes. Yeah, hey, other, Martin. Yes, someone else. Pat here. Uh, yes, sir. I found a little trick with taking uh, the insulation off a small wire and pulling it off. Yeah, and you end up with a, a nice piece of tubing. It works pretty good. And I take the uh, plastic uh, ones and cut them in half, and then slide the tubing over them. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'll work. Yeah, yep. you, can, you can make your own little nub, nub to hook up, hook the two ends together with the bl black tubing uh, insulation in between. Exactly. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Good job. Yep, thank Martin, you. thanks so much. See you next week. Yep. All right, now let's go back to Tom Farrell. Tom, I hope you got your computer back up and going. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. That was some sort of internet deal. Anyway, um, so uh, thank you for uh, having me this evening and um, start all over here. This evening, I'll be featuring uh, part four of my new series on the Turtle Creek tunnel and mining scene. Um, I'm going to go over several scratch builds this evening. And uh, let's, this is where I left off uh, last week. Uh, this was the coal tipple. Um, I thought I'd come up with a name for it. And uh, I usually use some sort of whimsical or family name, but this time I thought I'd use the uh, Mononga Coal Company, which has a history to it. Now, being from Western Pennsylvania, we have rivers named like the Mononga Hala, the Allegheny, the Susquehanna, the Yakagany. Uh, very difficult for non-Western Pennsylvania people to, to pronounce. This is actually from the Monongah, uh, is actually from uh, West Virginia. And uh, I'll get into exactly why I named it the Monongah. So there's a story behind this, so you'll get a quick little history lesson. Um, Way back in 1907, um, the Monongo mine in West Virginia had an explosion. Um, they believe it was from uh, uh, these gases that occur, combustible gases in the mines weren't properly vented in either a spark or one of the carbide flame lamps that the miners would wear um, ignited the, uh, the gases. And it killed 362 miners, uh, most of them instantly, they figure, and trapped a small number of survivors who they couldn't rescue. Um, and this is the worst mine disaster in the history of uh, mining in the United States. Um, you know, 100 plus years ago, the uh, owners of these mines were uh, focused solely on productivity, tons per day. Um, this, when I was researching coal tipples, and there's going to be a series of buildings out around my coal tipple, I ran into this story and I thought maybe it would be interest, interesting to name the my coal mine. That
You're breaking up, Tom. And then pay tribute to this. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, no. Yeah. We okay. can now. You're breaking up quite a bit before. Go ahead. Uh, somebody, where did I leave off, Jim? I don't want to repeat my. Uh, right where you are is good. All right. So, anyway, the people that ran these coal mines at the turn of the century focused on tons per hour, tons per day, and not on safety. And I think when I was researching other supporting buildings for my uh, mining operation, I ran into this story and I thought it would be of interest to, uh, if you don't talk about things. You're gone again, Tom. We're losing you. Tom, Tom you're totally gone. or remember them, or just a little. I'm going to switch computers one more time. Tom, I'm going to get off this computer, go to another one. All right, so what I'm going to do is go to uh, to Steve Sherrill, because uh, we're running, starting to run so late. Can you hear me? So, uh, yes. Steve, let me go to you. Yes. Do you have your computer up, Tom, your other one? Yeah, it'll just take a second. Um, you want me next, or am I the last one here? Uh, we know Steve Sherrill's supposed to be after you, but we're starting to run over, starting to get you know tight on time is the problem here. So, all right. I'm uh, sorry. If it's going to take you a while, I'll go ahead and go uh, to Steve and then come back to you. I got it right now. Hold on. He's okay, okay. Jim. Sorry, the stupid thing. I'm sorry about this. It happens to the rest of us. We're back. Especially me. <laughs> hey. Just a second. Mm. Maybe next week. <laughs> I don't know. You're okay now, but when you get close to the uh, computer, it seems to die out for some reason. Oh. Yeah, guys, you're just coming. You're coming and going. All right. Um, and you're gone. Again. Give it Is one it, more shot. All right, last chance. Then uh, <laughs> this video is going to be screwed up. Okay, slideshow. <laughs> All right. All right. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. We'll just pretend like business as usual. <laughs> <laughs> this yes. is the the Mona Mononga mine disaster is the worst in American history, and. Um, at the time, the Fairmont Coal Company, like other companies in the that era, focused on the output of the mines rather than the uh, any safety considerations. And um, I think a lot of you know that I was the CEO of the largest dimensional stone company in the world. And um, we had seven operating quarries. We didn't do underground mining, but something always on my mind running these this large quarry operation was the safety because i i would always tell the guys in the mill or in the quarry or in the yards that it was more important to be safe than to produce limestone and it was always hanging on my mind and it, to me it's just inconceivable 100 plus years ago that there was no consideration for safety so anyway, I um, decided to to uh, name this the uh, Monongah Mine, Monongah Coal Company, and pay a little tribute. This is the sign, and the name, of course, reflects the disaster. The mine number was the number of miners killed, and this was the year of the accident. 
So if somebody in the off chance ever visits my layout here in Bloomington, Indiana, it has a legitimate story rather than the whimsical or family and friend names that I normally um, fly with. So anyway, enough of the history lesson this evening and on with the build. Um, so on that coal tipple, I last left it without railings. I marked these um, one inch apart, which is equal to four feet. And then I cut uh, a series of, uh, these are scale four by fours, and I super glued them around the perimeter of my deck. And then I put on the railings, which are uh, basically one by fours this time. And then I wanted to put a little detail on of the pool, and I use these Grantline two and a half inch square nuts. So these don't have a washer on them. They're of sort, not a large washer. They're basically just a bolt head and a little washer. So you, with your pin vise, you just drill a hole, um, maybe an eighth of an inch deep, cut the um, bolt with a uh, X-Acto knife, put a drop of super glue in there, and uh, it adds a really nice detail to a structure. There's a close up of the uh, Mononga coal tipple. It's almost done. There's a few things that I have to do. I have to put a conveyor behind the, the structure that leads to the underground mine. I've got to glue this building down to the tipple. It's just sitting there for now. I've got some uh, I did on my Re, uh, timber tunnel portal and retaining wall. And uh, of course, these loading chutes aren't finished. I'm going to make them uh, metal with rivets and some gates there. So that should be done next time. Next, immediately outside of the coal tipple is the uh, a sheet metal fence. And I took bought this stuff from Northeastern Scale Lumber. It's actual corrugated aluminum. I've used all kinds of corrugated materials. I've used paper. I've used uh, uh, other brands. This seems to do the best job for me. The only thing tricky about this is it is actual metal. So what I do is I pull a sheet out and then I, I always put an enamel of some kind on it before I paint it with acrylics or pastels or chalks. So. People that have seen my videos in the past have, um, I've used this American Accents rust material. It's just a nice orange color. And I had to build a, a, a for my metal fence, I had to build a, something to support it on. So here I have um, two by sixes running uh, about six scale feet in height and 11 feet, 44 scale feet in length. And then I simply, uh, glued it together, um, making this uh, eight scale feet high with those four by four posts. And then I glued the, uh, I cut that sheet metal up into random pieces and widths and put, uh, let's see how I cut the ends. You know, I put angles and just generally beat them up a little bit. This is still just a base color. Then I put some highlights of, um, old silver of the Floquil poison toluene solvent paint. I rarely use it, but I pulled it out for this. And then uh, I put it in place. And then I put a sign up for uh, no dumping under penalty by order of city commissioner. I just made that on PowerPoint myself, printed it out, glued it onto the, the fence. Um, Pat noted last time that he was concerned that my engines or cars would roll off the edge here. This is right below the tipple. <laughs> I put up uh, bumpers. Um, so those are, the cars are now uh, relative safety. <clears throat> and there's the scene. So the, jo the joke here is uh, no dumping under penalty. And of course, that's all you see. So that's a little... Ode to uh, John Allen. He did a lot of things like this. 
but the scene you can see it's really developing nicely um you know there's a barrel here with spilt uh some sort of toxin piles of wood this is a casting these are just copper or brass pipes anyway it just makes for an interesting scene right next to that dump is a water tower and i have shown this before there's a scratch built water tower but it's unweathered uh, at this point here are very light weathering. Uh, these are all four sides. First thing I did is I put a base coat of white acrylic on there. That was a big step for me because this looks perfect. And now I have to paint this onto it. So I'm like hoping I'm doing the right thing here because I don't feel like painting another or doing another one. But it came out very nice. So I... I I basically took black acrylic paint with the same white paint and I made some grays. So it goes from white to gray to black. And by using the base color, the same paints for the gray to mix the gray it has a nice feel to it. It's not like the grays stand out. They're all, they all blend together. The idea is to show that this is um, growing algae and rotting a little bit. And um, it's turning out to be a nice scene. There's another view. This is just cotton I put in there for the hell of it to see how that would look. <clears throat> <laughs> Not sure if it worked. I'll need a vote on that one. <laughs> it's, but it's um, it's coming along. Everything along my main line is going to be dumpy looking. There's going to be shanty towns, uh, junkyards, hobo camps. 1930, height of the Depression. And uh, next time I'll do a little bit more work on this hillside and this this is an <laughs> uh, abandoned tunnel here and it'll be an abandoned track in here. But uh, it's really shaping up uh, nicely for me. And that's, it really is beautiful modeling, John. Yes, yeah, I don't know what the problem yeah, was. Yeah, thank you. Any questions on this? I love the extra detail, Tom. It really brings out the whole scene. Tom, um, mm -hmm. what kind of cotton was that? <laughs> <laughs> right out of a medicine jar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now <laughs> now that we've got Ms. now that now that Steve Sherrill has appeared, we're just going to introduce him and let him <laughs> do his segment on what do you want to talk about? So it's all of yours, Steve. Oh, okay. Well, well, tonight I'm going to talk about a very busy April. I know we all sometimes have certain times of the year which are very busy for us. Um, April has been uh, where it's going to be. A really, really busy month as far as model railroading goes. And personally, recently I had a cataract operation on both eyes. And um, for the first time in 77 years, I don't need glasses. Or at least that's what they told me. Now I need reader glasses, even though I have a 2015 vision. Figure that out. I can't. But anyway. Let's go on to what we have to do for being busy this month. Um, first off, I'm getting ready for the Harrisburg all O scale show. I know we're gonna get some, some of our group here um, at that show also. I'm packing up and I'm bringing up uh, a friend's 48 car she is selling at the show. So I'll have to, uh, you know, put, that's going to be in my car, filling it up. I've got two micros I'm going to be uh, showing, two micro layouts, and I might even sell a couple of items. Um, secondly, there, there are a few train shows in, in the area here that I want to kind of mention. One is April 13th at uh, Martinsburg Roundhouse. Uh, the, it's by the Bunker Hill Train Club. And that roundhouse was built in 1846, and it's still standing. And they have the train show inside the roundhouse. 
So if anybody is in the area, it's it's a very, very nice little show, and you get to see a, a nice roundhouse structure. Not too many of those left. Um, it's well worth going to see the train show. Also, uh, I'll be operating on Steve Bittinger's uh, uh, G-scale layout on Sunday after the Harrisburg all, all O-scale show. And then, of course, uh, we have the Great Scale Train show on the 27th and 28th, and Greg and I will be there uh, with, with our banner to uh, introduce some people to uh, our show here and uh, kind of see if we can get some scholarship entries and people interested in the scholarship. Um, so is, is anybody else got any shows that they want to talk about today? Yeah, Steve, I'll also have the banner up at uh, the Harrisburg show on Saturday. Okay. All right. I didn't know if you that, – that would be good. Yep. Well, I'm trying to talk. What, are you going to have it at your table? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, the Harrisburg all low scale show should be really something. They, there are no tables left. They're all sold out. Um, I actually got a call from Al about when I was going to be there, what time, so I could so you could take the uh, the collection that I'm bringing up. So um, there's going to be many tables. He said of structures that he's he's got a collection that he's purchased. Um, you know, it's just a very busy month. I know we all all get these and it looks like I only have one weekend left I'm not doing anything or maybe not who knows but one thing I did find out now that um, the cataract operation has been completed with and it was very simple very easy um, modeling looks a little different right now when you don't need your glasses um, and you know, I'm starting to look at some of the mistakes I've made. <laughs> They're starting to stand out a little bit now. So I'm going to have to correct some of that. But uh, I'm, just close one eye. Like I can't <laughs> <laughs> close both of them, you know. <laughs> but uh, so I'll be driving up. Uh, have, they tell you not to drive for a day. So I didn't drive, I got a ride, but uh, to the appointment yesterday morning. But uh, it, it's really amazing what they can do. You know, they don't really put you asleep during this operation. It um, it kind of puts you in twilight, they call it. But I was sitting in there, and I, and you can see the light, of course. And here, here are these guys over top of me, and and the nurse says, "Isn't that a nice mustache?" <laughs> <laughs> what you know they're I'm raving I can just see them that you know right now they're going to, you know, unbelievable some of the stuff that people do but um yeah I don't know um John was is John on he, he was going to say a few words about his collection that he lost was stolen is he, he, covered, is he that last, covered that last week right no, he was going to say some a few things today. I think. I guess he's not though. I don't see him right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he's going to be back. Sorry, right. I so Steve, to... you're on the operating table, and the nurse is flirting with you, huh? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, some of me, some of me wouldn't want to flirt with, but there were a couple of yeah. <laughs> I told my wife, I came home, I had my glasses off. I said, I'm back. You know? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, Martin, thanks for doing that 34 pages. I, I appreciate oh. all the stuff you do, really. I, I, don't think, I don't think you get enough credit. You know, you're, you've got your hands into everything, just about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my hand out of some things this year, if I can. <laughs> Oh, uh, you'll be right there. Yeah, I need to retire. I need to retire again. Uh, but, yeah, they, but the cataract surgery is fun. Um, on because uh, it, it, I've worn glasses since uh, second grade, <clears throat> and I had 
a, fift, no, a fift, 15 correction plus on both sides and prisms in my lenses. Wow. And they did mine a week apart as opposed to two weeks apart. Oh. Because uh, they, they did it close together because the doctor realized, you know, okay, you're, you're going to have great vision on one side and you're going to need that glass. You're going to need to have glasses on the other side. I just popped the lens out of my glasses, but yeah. it still was weird. And um, it corrected, getting the lenses inserted, it corrected the uh, need for prisms. Mm -hmm. So I didn't need them anymore, which the doctor and I could not explain or understand, but we just said, stop talking about it and keep moving. Uh, <laughs> yeah. take, 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 take the positives, the extra bonuses when you can get them. Um, it, but I, you know, you say you're in twilight when you're out. Uh, they put me down a lot further than twilight because I told them up front and the doctor already knew I'm a really, 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 really bad patient. Yeah. When you come close to my eyes with anything, no, no, I'm a really bad patient. Like the second eye, you know, he, the, the anesthesiologist was sitting in there talking to me and the doctor came in and he said, oh yeah, we're going to take, you know, the anesthesiologist was like, oh, we'll take care of it. There's no problem. And the doctor looked at me and looked at him and said, double it for him. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I told him I was apprehensive and uh, they said, don't worry, we'll take care of it. Uh, it and no, I, I live, when it comes to my eyes, I started apprehensive. I'm already there. I'm there now, you know, it's, it's just, that's normal. I, I go right. Cause I had a detached retina. I've forgotten how many years ago. And that was three months of recovery mm. for after the surgery to put my eye back together. Yeah. And ever since then, anything, you know, yeah. that threatens I had, eyes. I had done in the fall, but I kept the, I have very little correction to the distance vision, but I found doing this every time I wanted to see this and then look at the model and see this and everything was pain in the neck. So I just said, fine, you know, I've got the reading down here and that just makes a difference. Did you notice colors are better? Oh yeah. Sure. Uh, everything is, has an edge. I only have one eye, and when I had the cataract surgery done, I was totally in 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 shock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had had a I had the first one done, hadn't had the second. I'm sitting reading, and we got a new couch when we moved, and I looked, you know, out of this eye at it. I said, "Wait a minute, what the hell?" Everything's oh, nice and bright. bright. I thought I thought it was sort of yellowish gray, yeah, and then I said, "Oh my God! I painted all those models. I hope they don't look garish." What the? <laughs> the plus side for me is I only had to have one done. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh. quite, hmm. it's quite the operation when they get you know when I they get this done. It's it's literally an assembly line where I got mine done. You know, there's it, it, like oh yeah, there's, there's yeah. like eight. Eight or, ten, eight or ten booths, and basically they just wheel you in and wheel the next guy out and wheel the next one in. Yeah. Take a number. That, yeah. you know, take a number. We'll call you when you're ready. Yep. Yeah. But it's just amazing that the technology exists to do this. It's really a. It, it's a non. It's a. It's a, It's basically almost a, a trivial exercise now. It's impressive that this is available. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know. It, Eventually, you went blind. You couldn't drive. I, I couldn't. I was really bothered by driving at night. Oh yeah, with the cataract. Yep. You know that was the what did it for me. Well, I, I'd gotten to the point where the doctor said, "Well, we can't. We can't adjust your prescription anymore." Yeah, we, we'll schedule for surgery next week or next yeah. month. You know, <laughs> like okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had a whole month to work up a, a good, good sense of terror. <laughs> The good thing about it, Medicare pays for it all too. Right. If if you're on Medicare, well, yeah. which I wasn't. <laughs> oh, I, I was. I'm. I, I, I was a little too young. I was. Uh -huh. still, I was still working. Well, well, I just had mine. Of course, yeah. Well, well, it's. Mm. I know my son had had the laser vision 
Ooh. He was the first one to qualify for flying helicopters in the Army with, with a laser correction. And he had to get permission from the Secretary of Defense and all this kind of stuff, you know. And uh, luckily, luckily he graduated and everything worked out. But, um, you know, he flew in three three different wars. Yeah. Hey, Steve, well, that's it, Steve. Thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for leading this medical uh, situation tonight. <laughs> and I think uh, I think we'll stop it right here, and we can carry it on after uh, after Pat turns off the uh, the recording. So, yeah. Pat, if you can play the caboose for us. And oh, by the way, before you play the caboose, uh, we need more cabooses. This is the last one I think Pat has. So if any of you have a, a short uh, recording of your model railroad or something else that you think we could use, please send it to Pat and Pat will put his email address in the uh, chat function for you because I think this is the last caboose that we've got right now. Gives you a nice chilly feeling. It's like Why my we back moved to Florida? <laughs> Canada in July. <laughs> Wait till you see the engine. And nothing to do with Canada. Canada in April. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That isn't a Canadian. <laughs> There we go, guys. Well, folks that's, folks, that's our show tonight. So we hope you enjoyed it. Most importantly, hope you learned something. That's what it's all about. And with that said, happy modeling. See you next Wednesday. Mr. Chancellor, just a couple.